for allowing me to be here. Uh, my wife and I personally have been looking forward to this. Uh, we just love to worship with other, other people, God's people, and see how, people, uh, how different churches worship God together. And we love to see God's work happening around the city. Uh, so one of the things uh, where we meet is Pulaski High School, so we're very, very familiar with a lot of the architecture here. So it's, you guys have done a lot of great stuff with your space. It, it's very hospitable, so that, that's much appreciated. Uh, let me just tell you a quick couple words about myself and my wife. Uh, my wife is down here. Her name is Danica. We've, so it's Dan and Danica. And uh, I know, it's, it's so sweet. <laughs> we, we've been married for just over 12 years and we have two beautiful girls. Uh, the oldest one is six. Her name is Talitha, uh, or we, we call her Tally. And then our youngest is Selah, and she is four. And um, yeah, I, I would just say as well, I remember the day that I first talked with Pete. We, he was actually still moving in the north, living in the northwest, hadn't moved to the city yet. And I just remember talking to him about his excitement about coming to Milwaukee, planting a church. And I remember uh, getting off the phone and saying something to the effect to Danica, man, that guy is a fireballer for Jesus, and I cannot wait until his family gets here. And uh, it, it's, I feel like that every time I run into him and we have coffee, uh, it's a great blessing for me, and I, I'm a big fan of, of Pete. Uh, so it's a joy to be here, jump into this series on warning, uh, this idea of Jesus warning his people to not displace God from the throne of their hearts. So it's, it's warning because Jesus is trying to protect his people from worshiping other things that would actually destroy their soul, to shrinking their life to the size of themselves. And so Jesus is warning them from that and saying, get your eyes focused on the right thing that will give you joy in your soul. We were made to worship, and in worshiping God, we find our deepest joy. And so we continue on. Uh, in Matthew 6. If you have a Bible, you can open to it to Matthew 6. That will be our text uh, this morning, Matthew 6, 34. So I've just been given one verse. It's this, at the end of this passage on anxiety. Uh, I believe the passage will be up on the screen for you, Matthew 6, 34. Uh, let me just go ahead and read it so you see it. There Jesus says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now when you, I, when you hear that, I don't know what you think. Uh, perhaps you, you don't worry very much and you hear that and you're like, okay, great. Uh, that'll be fine. I won't worry about tomorrow. But perhaps there's others here who hear that and feel an immediate sense of guilt because you actually do worry about tomorrow. In fact, you're racked with guilt or fear about tomorrow. You have become an expert worrier. You can do it intuitively. Nobody even has to tell you to worry. You just do it. That's what an expert is, right? Maybe you hear that as a harsh rebuke. Don't worry about tomorrow. What are you thinking? Or maybe you hear that as, as a, a helpless, hopeless command. Yeah, great. That's nice words for my neighbor. There's no way I could possibly walk in the good of that. There's no way I could spend a day without worrying about tomorrow. I don't know where you are, uh, but I, I will tell you from my own experience, my own life, um, I fall very much into the latter. Uh, I uh, grew up uh, an expert worrier. I've learned how to worry very well, and it's something that I've battled through. Others, some sins in my life God uh, took out of my life immediately when I came to faith at the age of 23. Others have lingered and lingered and lingered, and this is one of them. Uh, it's been probably about nine years now since I've had my last panic attack, but I had about two or three years where I, I suffered regularly from panic attacks. So perhaps you're here this morning and you have suffered that or you know somebody that has. It's, an, it's a horrifying experience. You get tunnel vision and you feel like your, your heart is about to pop out of your chest. It's, it's, it's t- terrifying. Um, I've had 
you know, these OCD type struggles where I have these obsessive thoughts and I try to do these compulsions to cancel them out. It's an enslaving way to live. And if I'm not wrestling in one of those deep struggles, then I just kind of have this low grade anxiety through the day. And so Jesus in this passage is going to answer a very important question for my own soul. Why should you not worry about tomorrow? So it's very personal to me. I want to know Jesus' answer. Why do I not need to worry about tomorrow? Do you have real substance for me, Jesus? Or are these just words that I can turn on the afternoon talk show and hear? And so that's what we're going to see today. So there's two points to the sermon. It'll be pretty easy to follow. First will be a human dilemma. The second will be the divine solution. Those will be our two points. A, a human dilemma and point number two, the divine solution. Uh, before we jump into it, let me pray and uh, ask God's blessing upon uh, his word. Uh, God, we long to be like the psalmist um, who proclaims that you are our refuge, you are our strength, and you are our very present help. Not distant, but a present help in trouble. And therefore, even if the, the earth gives way and the mountains totter and the, 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 the waters roar and tremble, we will feel secure. God, if you would delight, I ask that through the proclamation of your word, you would free um, anyone here who is enslaved to worry today. And if you don't choose to do that, God, I ask that you would give each person who wrestles with worry regularly a few nuggets to take home and to continue to fight the battle of faith. God, help us to see the struggle of worry as an opportunity to actually worship and declare to the world that you are trustworthy even in the face of fear. For your fame and for the good of your people, in the name of the risen Christ, amen. All right, so number one, a human dilemma. Here's one of the human dilemmas. Uh, You know it very well. Uh, You are here today. You know a little bit about what's going to happen this afternoon, maybe. Maybe you got some plans. You hope you know what's going to happen. And you have tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. And really, you know very little about it. And it most likely will have pleasure and pain. And you have to figure out what to do with that. We we could probably come up with a nice list of pleasures that we would all love, right? Next week you're going to get a raise. That would be awesome. Next week you're going to go to a festival or a a feast or Thanksgiving meal. That's really great. We're going to go see family. This is is exciting. We could easily have a list like that. But I I trust there's another list that you probably don't want to write. That's all the possible pains that are ahead that you don't know. You could walk in this week to your work and realize you just lost your job. You could lose all your savings over the course of the next three months and have nothing. You could catch a a very dangerous illness You could walk into the mall and get caught in crossfire. You could have something happen to one of your children. Your spouse could walk out on you. You could get bit by the neighborhood dog right on the nose and have surgery after surgery. You could sink into a crippling depression next week. There's a list that you don't want to think about. And every living person faces it. And now here's the thing that we all would agree on. Nobody wants to worry about it, right? That is, that is not a good solution. That does not give you the nice, happy life. That it's, I've never met a single person uh, who, who, you know, growing up, they say, when I grow up, I want to be really good at worrying Because when I see people worry, they're always so happy. Nobody wants to worry. 
So right off the bat, you know that's not a good solution. Now, people come up with solutions for this problem, right? Uh, one, one would be, well, what you need to do, continue to strengthen yourself, get yourself psyched up, and be able to look at tomorrow and say, whatever the world throws at me, I will handle it. I can make it. Or another solution uh, would be, oh, you know, you, you can't change any of that. You can't, so just don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Just eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy today because you can't control that stuff. Or, or another uh, thought would be, well, if you believe God enough and don't sin, then those things won't even happen to you. Now, hopefully you hear those three solutions and you, you know those aren't going to work. Because there's no possible way you can strengthen yourself for every possible situation that's going to happen. Because you don't know what that is. You know that it's not a good idea to just distract yourself and, and be in denial and act like, oh, nothing's going to happen. Because things are going to happen. So that's not going to help you either. And for the third one, all you have to do is read the rest of Scripture. There was a man who was perfect in faith all the time and who never sinned and he wasn't guarded from the, from the suffering. The Lord Jesus was mocked and he was beaten, he was spat on, he was stripped naked and he was crucified. So that, that didn't work. The apostles, all but one of them, was cru- or also killed for proclaiming Jesus. That's not a solution. So what are we going to do? Thankfully, Jesus says there's another path. And that's what he wants to show us today. Why should I not worry about tomorrow? The divine solution. So we're already on point two. We're moving along real nice here. Now the answer you're going to see is very simple. And like most most things in the kingdom of God, they're very simple and very clear, and yet they're deep and profound. And the question for you and I today is not necessarily, am I going to believe this thing up here in theory, but am I going to believe it down here where I live? And actually, as I go about my day, am I going to take that theory and am I going to say, I actually believe this stuff and I'm going to live like it? That's what we have to wrestle with today. So you're going to see the divine solution um, is pretty clear, pretty simple, and we're going to see if we're going to trust that or not. So here's what I think the solution is in the passage. Um, here's what Jesus says is, you will be given God's grace and help for today. Tomorrow, you will be given God's grace and help for Tomorrow. You're not getting God's grace for tomorrow, today. There's, a, there's enough going on here for that. You don't need that grace yet, it's just today. So we'll flesh that out a little bit, but let's follow his argument uh, on the te- in, the, in the text here. So again, Matthew 6, 34, Jesus begins, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Now if you have scripture open you can look up at verse 25 this is actually the third time that Jesus has given this command do not be anxious so verse 25 you see it there therefore I tell you don't be anxious about your life what you eat or what you drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing I look down at verse 31 therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what what should we wear and now those first two you see are uh, this idea about don't be anxious about food, body, clothing. And he's going to wrap this whole discussion up by expanding it and saying, everything tomorrow. You have nothing to worry about. Now notice he doesn't say, don't think about it. Don't prepare about it or for it. Don't make plans for it. That's not what Jesus says. Actually, Scripture commends um, God's people to prepare for tomorrow. He commends the farmer for sowing the, sowing the seed, plowing the field, sowing the seed in hope of a, a harvest. So it's, it's doing the hard work, but it's not living in dread of tomorrow or disquieted heart or consumed by tomorrow. It's saying you do what you can today and you entrust everything to God. 
And then he continues, verse 34, for or be, because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Now that's a curious statement to me. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. It's, it's almost this personification, like tomorrow takes on human qualities and it, it just is anxious for itself. I have no idea why he stated it that way. Uh, but here's the best I can do uh, in, in terms of trying to picture what he's trying to get at. Um, perhaps you've either done this or seen this happen or you, you, were, you were a little Billy once yourself. Uh, a, a mom tells the two little kids uh, to go upstairs and clean the playroom and she comes upstairs and, and sees that Billy is not cleaning the toys. And so she comes in, she says, Billy, I gave you a command to clean the toys and you're not doing it. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and if you don't have those Legos picked up, there's going to be consequences. And what does Billy say, uh, his sister's there, what does Billy say? Betty's not doing it. Right, and what does mom respond? Billy? Don't worry about Betty. You worry about yourself. Right? Because what she is saying is that Betty is not your responsibility. Betty's my responsibility. I'll take care of it. Billy, you have enough to worry about about yourself. Right? And that's what Jesus continues on, right? Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So that's where I understand Jesus going. Notice the word sufficient. It's the word enough. There are enough troubles for you today. You have enough things to deal with today. Why in the world would you go to tomorrow and try to bring those in today? That's not your responsibility is what I understand Jesus saying. You can't handle that stuff yet. You have enough trouble for today. And so he says, don't worry. Don't worry about the rest. Now the other thing that you know if you worry about tomorrow is that when you're worrying about tomorrow, uh, you get so consumed by that that you actually are neglecting today, right? Right? I mean, to my own shame, I, I can think of very particular times that I have been racked with worry and I have, rather than serve my family and care for um, my girls and my wife, I sit on the couch because I'm just trying to distract myself. I pull up Facebook. I do something to help me stop thinking about it. And I'm neglecting what I'm supposed to be doing. So Jesus says you have enough here to worry about, so don't be anxious about the rest. Now if that that was all that Jesus said, that really would not be that much different than what you could find on Dr. Phil. Right? I mean, there's nothing really Christian about that. So we got to pull the lens back, even if you see in verse 34, the very first word there, what is it? Therefore, do not be anxious. So Jesus is coming from somewhere to get to this point, and he's heading somewhere. And so I, what I want us to see is where he's come from and where he's headed. With one particular thing I want to point out. As Jesus went around taught, teaching about the kingdom of God, he began to use a phrase to talk about God that was earth-shattering for the people. He began to refer to God as my Father. Now the idea of God being Father was present in the Old Testament, um, but what was different is that Jesus actually began to talk about God as being his Father. There was this familial relationship. It wasn't just that God was like a Father, but now it's God is my Father. And this was very different for the people. And then what happens is Jesus not only is saying, my Father in heaven, but then he turns around to his people, his followers, and he says, 
your Father in heaven. Which is something very different for the people. Now in the book of Matthew, that little phrase about your Father, or your Father in heaven, or your heavenly Father, is found 16 times throughout the book. 13 of those times is in the Sermon, of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. So this series that you've been going through at Imago Dei is just beaming with your father, your father. This is, is getting into promise. This is why I warn you, because you have a father in heaven who wants to rain his grace on you. And so let me just show you some of these. Uh, we're not gonna, I'm not going to show all of them to you, but even just in Matthew 6, if you turn your head, uh, eyes back, I think it will be on the screen here. I just want to read you some of these passages so you see this recurrent, reoccurring frame, uh, refrain. Reoccurring refrain? You know what I mean. So Matthew 6, 4 says, So that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 8, Do not be like them because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 14, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor do they reap. They don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are not you of more value than they? Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Because the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. In verse 7, ask, and it will, be given, it, you will, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. Because everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which of you? If his son asks him for bread, would give him a stone. Or if his son asks for a fish, would give his son a serpent. Now, if you, who are evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Now, is it not encouraging if you were, uh, a dad is taking his little girl to Chuck E. Cheese and she's afraid of the mouse and he says, don't worry, honey, daddy's going to be with you. Now, for the little girl, that's comforting, somewhat, right? But she knows, okay, dad is powerful, he's great, I can trust him, but that mouse is still going to be there. I don't know if dad can take the mouse, right? <laughs> but you see what Jesus is saying here? The God that is all-knowing, the God that is all-power, the God that just speaks and creation becomes, the God that is righteous and all-wise and gracious and compassionate and loving, that God is Your father, he cares for the birds that are billions and billions and billions of little, little birds that you would pay a penny for. He cares for the lilies. And that God is your father, and he knows everything you need before it even comes off your tongue. And therefore... You can only be here. There's enough to worry about. The Father, my Father, your Father will be there tomorrow and he will give you all the grace that you possibly could think of or dream of and even more for what happens tomorrow. You have no need. That is not, this is not your responsibility. That is what you should pay, be paying attention to and leave this to your Father. Now that is very good news. 
Now, the, one of the problems for the worrier, I know that sounds like warrior, but worrier, one of the problems for the worrier is that when you look forward to tomorrow, and when I look forward to tomorrow, there's this little voice that begins to talk in your mind, and you see all these imaginative scenarios that obviously are going to happen. And do you know who's not present in tomorrow? God is not in your imagination for tomorrow. His grace is not there for you tomorrow. It's like picturing yourself on an airplane, which if you are a worry wart is enough to think about. But you're not only on the airplane, but as you're sitting there, who comes out of the cockpit but the pilot, and he opens the window and he jumps off the plane. And now you're there to face the plane yourself. And friends, if that's what tomorrow brings, that is horribly terrifying. And you should be very afraid. But Jesus is saying, you have a pilot who knows better than anyone how to fly this plane. And I'm not asking you to take some vague promise about tomorrow's going to be fine. I'm telling you, your father will care for that. And he knows what you need. And he'll provide you the grace for it. Now, another problem that the worrier has is that you might even hear that. And the voice says, okay, great, 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 fine. I know, I know we can trust God for that. He'll have grace for that. Uh, but that's not enough. Because I, I actually want to feel that grace right now so I feel safe about tomorrow then I'll be okay if that can happen I'll be fine I I just want to take the whole trust component out and I just want to feel it today here would be an example that probably everybody can relate even if you don't worry Uh, say you're reading a Christian biography or you hear of some story and uh, about somebody having a gun put to their head or a knife to their throat or, or their Uh, on a pole about to be burned to death and all the people say is if you reject Jesus you can live and you hear the people standing strong and saying I will not reject my savior now oftentimes when you hear those stories at least in most people's uh, minds what happens is you, you start going would I stand strong in that moment I I just can't, I mean, at that moment, oh, my whole life is going to flash behind me. Do Do I have what it takes to not reject Jesus in that point? There's a little bit of fear, a little bit of guilt that rises up with that. But here's the thing. That might happen tomorrow. You're not there tomorrow. You're not there right now. So why in the world would you think you would have the power to stand strong in that moment? If that were to happen, God will give you the grace to handle the moment. But he's not going to throw this grace over to today so you can feel it. It's a principle that goes all through, throughout scripture. I mean, this is the manna principle. When God took his people through the wilderness, he said, I will rain down manna, this is like bread, for you for the day. Don't save any for tomorrow. It'll go moldy. Tomorrow, I will bring new manna for you. Don't save any because it will go moldy. Tomorrow, I will give you new manna. It's teaching his people to trust him that each day there's enough for today. So what Jesus, I understand, I'm saying sufficient you have for today. God knows what you need um, and he will give you the grace. It's uh, Jeremiah as he's sitting in the, the ruins of Jerusalem right when God's people got kicked out of the land in Lamentations, this, this book of weeping right in the middle. It's a very famous passage where he says God's the steadfast love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. They're new every morning. New mercy for new troubles. And when you, ex- or uh, think of it this way, can you possibly imagine the type of grace you would need if you were drowning in the sea to be able to trust God? 
Could you, can you imagine the grace that you would need if you were getting mugged? I cannot imagine that type of grace that I would need for that type of stuff. But to shrink down God's grace to the size of our imagination, it's just not a smart thing to do. You can't do it. And Jesus is trying to help you here throughout the Sermon on the Mount. God will provide all the grace you need. And if that's true, then there's no need to worry. Now, if it's not true, then we're, we're wasting our time. Absolutely wasting your, you're wasting your time when you think, uh, when you try to try. When it, it would be silly. But if it's true, it's some of the greatest news in the world. And when you've ever experienced it, um, it's, it's absolutely free. It's like when you've been at the pool and you see the little kid standing on the edge of the pool and dad is in the water for the first time the kid is about ready to jump she's terrified because she doesn't know exactly what's going to happen and if you're watching this you are rooting for this little girl to leap because in leaping is freedom you want to know what slavery is for the girl at that moment to pull back, to shrink the world to the size of what she can think of. And that's what worry will do to you. It will shrink your life down to this little nugget. When God is saying, come and jump. And I will give you all the grace you need for today. And tomorrow, I will give you that grace tomorrow. Just wait and see. And so part of the hard things of the Christian life is to take hold of that little voice in you that perhaps right now is saying, yes, but not me. And grab hold of that little guy and say, stop it. The gospel's true. And you lie to me and you lie to me, but Christ has died and he has risen. And there's hope. Now, I do have to say this promise is not for everyone, though. This promise is for those who have God as your father. To which the Apostle John writes in his first chapter of his uh, 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 gospel that those who received Jesus and believed on his name, it is to those that he gave the right to be called children of God. That's who this promise is for. If that's you, if you worship Jesus as the King, the true Messiah, then this promise is for you and it is glorious. If it's not for you, if it's not you, if you don't fall into that camp, these words are not for you. And tomorrow should be scary because the ultimate tomorrow will come the judgment at which God's grace will not be there for you. So here's God's word. His promise from the passage, I understand, if you pull back and get the context, is that today you will have enough grace for your trouble. And tomorrow, you will have that grace. Illustration, and then we wrap up. There's a book called uh, The Hiding Place. Uh, Some of you perhaps have heard of it. It's uh, written by Corrie Ten Boom, and she is the lone survivor of a a family of Dutch Christians uh, during the uh, beginning of World War II and they were protecting uh, Jewish people who were escaping from the, the oncoming Nazi army. And they were hiding them in their home, the hiding place. Uh, well, they ended up getting caught, and all of them got shipped off to concentration camps. And Corey is the only survivor of her family. Early in the book, she recounts a story that a, child, a neighborhood baby had died. Corey at this time is just a little child. And... Uh, she realizes for the first time that tomorrow is out of her control. That her dad could very well die tomorrow. And this, this terrified Corey as a little girl. And she tells the story of her weeping and being terrified in her room that daddy could die. 
And her dad very wisely came in to the room and sat on the edge of her bed. And he says, Corey? Or Corey said to her dad, I mean, just think of, think of being the dad at this point. And she said, Daddy, you just can't die, Daddy. You just can't die. He said, Corey, when, when you and me travel to Amsterdam and we get on that train, when do I, when do I give you the ticket to get on the train? She sniffled a little bit. And she, she said, Daddy, look, you give me the ticket right before we get on the train. And he said, that's right, Corey. I give you the ticket right before you get on and not a second sooner. And when the time comes that God would have one of us die, he will give you the grace you need and he won't give it to you a second earlier. But Corey, don't get ahead of him. He is your father and he loves you and he cares for you and he will give you that grace then. Pay attention to today, Corey. There's enough here. If you are a child of God, God will give you that ticket at the exact moment you need it and not a second earlier. And therefore, Jesus says you have no reason to worry about tomorrow. I'm not an expert in this. I'm stumbling and trying with you for God's grace to even get me to believe this and live in the good of it. But can you imagine a life where that was your daily walk? I trust that God will give me all the grace I need. That's freedom, friends. And if you just wonder if you've out sinned God's grace, just remember the Apostle Paul says, if God did not spare his son but delivered him up, how much more will he also give us all? things. You will never out this promise if you're God's people. There's grace for you. Let me pray. God, that, this whole idea, I just find uh, it's so easy for me to look at it and go, that, it just sounds way too good to be true. And I ask, God, for your grace to live in the good of this, not just today, uh, but next week and the month after that, if you should tarry, and for all of the days you give us. Thank you that you would bring us, sinners though we be, into your family and be a perfect heavenly father. God, I pray for this this gathering of this people, this local church, and ask your hand upon them to continue the good work you began in them until the day of Christ, that uh, many people would come to saving faith through the work here, and that this would be a people that the world would look on and say, God must be real because I've never seen anything like the way this people live. They trust God day by day, they care for the hurting, and they live sacrificially for the kingdom. That must be a God that is real and living and active. In the name of the risen Christ, amen.